It seems to me that there are several things in this psalm that point us to the Lord Jesus and his resolve to give himself for us, which I hope will be helpful for us as we come to the Lord's Supper um, a little later. In this psalm, which as you see from the, uh, the heading in small capitals to the choir master of David, this is a psalm of David, this is um, a Davidic psalm, and so here David is in a situation um, of imminent danger, a, a crisis moment. And we can see that from the words spoken to him in verses 1 to 3. So let me read verses 1 to 3 again. In the Lord I take refuge, says David. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So David here is seeking to hold on to the Lord by faith. You see that in the very opening line. In the Lord I take refuge. But there's this voice, we don't know what voice it was, but there's a voice telling David just to abandon his post and to flee for the mountains. Maybe it was a royal advisor. Or maybe it was David's own inner fears, we just don't know. Whoever it was, David recognizes that voice as a voice of unfaithfulness and unbelief. Now it's just worth pausing us to consider this. Fleeing danger is not in itself unfaithful. David fled various times. You can see that. Just turn back to Psalm 3 and just look at the, the, um, the heading of that psalm. That's the heading in capitals. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. And then you can see Psalm 57 in, in a similar little title. David fled on that occasion from Saul. Psalm 57, the, the little... Subtitle there. And Jesus himself told people to flee. You can see that in Matthew, in Matthew 24, verse 16. He told people to flee when, when necessary. However, there is a definite note, note in our psalm. In this voice, this shrill voice telling David to flee, there's a definite note of unfaithfulness, of unbelief. And it's particularly there in verse 3. You see that the, the ESV, I think, correctly, and, and the commentators would, would also uh, agree with this, the ones that I consulted. You see that the last line of verse 1 at, uh, up to the end of verse 3 are all in quotation marks in the ESV, and I, and I think that's correct. So th th this voice, this, this voice saying to f David to flee, it continues to the end of verse 3. And so verse 3 is, is, is the sort of the reason that this this advice or this urgent call is, is being issued because this person is saying it, or, or David's own inner fears, whichever it is, is thinking this. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's a sort of despairing note there then, isn't there? A despairing note of unbelief that the foundations are being destroyed is the assumption and to such an extent that there's nothing for it, as it were, but for the righteous just to run for it. Now the Psalms chart many states of mind. John Calvin considered them to chart an anatomy of all parts of the soul, he, he wrote um, at one point. So it's all sorts of seasons of the soul, all sorts of states of, of, of our mind and heart we go through are all represented here in the Psalms, including that sort of that, that sense of bit of terror that can, that can come to us, that we just need to run for it, as it were. But, no matter what state of mind or circumstances we go through, the point here is that there is a foundation that will never fail. There is never a need for the righteous, in other words, for God's covenant people, that those who are saved by grace. There's never a need for us to despair that the foundations are crumbling. There is a foundation that will never fail. And so David responds to this voice of despairing fear with the truths of the rest of the psalm. So let me read that, verses 4 to 7. The Lord is in his temple. You see, this is the foundation that nothing's going to destroy. The Lord is in, his is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind, shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright 
shall behold his face. So this is, if you like, the foundations that will not be destroyed. The foundations that will never crumble. And I'd love to cover all of this evening. We're actually not going to look at verse 7, though. That, that there's wonderful stuff uh, in there. I mean, the upright shall behold his face. That, that, that's, that's something that will never, never just be destroyed, that will never be taken away. Now, maybe some of us here this evening need to be reminded of these things tonight. Maybe for you, maybe you're going through times where you, you feel the foundations to be crumbling. But the Lord is in his heavenly sanctuary. He's on his throne. So there's this foundation that, that's never to be destroyed and never to be despaired of. Though everything else may fail, you can think of Psalm 46, the mountains surging and being uh, tottering into the heart of the sea. There is nonetheless a city. There is a fortress for God's people that will not fail. God in his holiness and sovereign power cannot fail. So the righteous, those who've taken refuge in the Lord's Messiah, that's who the righteous are in the Psalms. The righteous always have an unfailing foundation in our God. And so with such truths, David silenced this counsel of despairing unbelief, whether it's coming from within him or coming from his, uh, his advisors or whoever it was. He silences that by reminding himself, reminding maybe the person that told him these things or advised these things, that the foundations are indeed still intact. They're still in place and they never will be dismantled. Now, I just want to impress these things on us, and in particular by letting this psalm open a window for us onto the work of Christ and showing us that it's in Christ and his work that we have this solid, indestructible foundation. Christ is a dependable rock that believers have. You remember how Jesus, and in fact we'll sing it in our final song this evening, all other ground is sinking sand, but we have a rock that is not sinking sand, and Christ is that rock, a dependable rock. So what I want to do this evening is to show this by tracing the parallels between David and Jesus. And, um, that is uh, not a strange thing to do. Um, David is, is very often a... Um, a type, a pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see that both in the narratives in 1 and 2 Samuel, but we see it in the Psalms as well. Uh, and so as we look at David here this evening, we are looking at a window into Christ. We're looking at a pattern of Christ that Christ fulfills. King David here faced then this voice urging him to flee in unbelief and unfaithfulness. And so as we see David dismiss this unfaithful voice, we see the prefigurings of the Lord Jesus similarly dis, uh, dismissing uh, uh, calls for him to, to flee and abandon his post. As we'll see in just a moment, many times Jesus faced voices urging him to flee the path of the cross. But at each point, Jesus overcame. He refused the path of ease and comfort and safety for himself and rather chose the path of suffering and sacrifice for our sake. So the theme I'm particularly gleaning from our passage this evening then is this. It's Christ, our undeterrable saviour. Let's look at the first of a few New Testament passages we'll look at on this theme. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. It's on page 809. Here we have the temptation of Jesus by the devil. This is straight after his baptism, right at the very beginning of his public ministry. And these temptations, we know, were not simply uh, confined to this one time. Uh, there are very close parallels between voices that are spoken to Jesus on the cross uh, and the voice of the devil in this passage. Uh, but this gives us a window into the sorts of things that Jesus was facing, the, the calls he was facing. Now, uh, let me read this whole passage. It's worth us hearing uh, these three temptations. We're just going to look at one of them, in fact, but it's worth us hearing the whole thing. So M Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, 
He was hungry, and the tempter, that is the devil, came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and serve, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So here the devil tempts Jesus with various things, including the one we're going to look at, which is giving Jesus all the nations. If Jesus would bow down and worship the devil. Now it was wickedness to worship Satan, so Jesus refuses that. But what we need to see is what was potentially tempting in this temptation for Jesus? Well, wasn't it that it, that it would have short-circuited out the cross? Jesus would have come into his, into his, um, his, his inheritance as Lord of all, which was his destiny to do, but it would have been a cross-free path to glory, a suffering-free path to glory. And so Jesus would have gained his destiny, his inheritance, which is to rule the nations of the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords, but without any salvation for us, without the cross. And so Jesus faithfully refuses that temptation. He refuses not only then to worship Satan, but he refuses to shun the path of the cross. He refuses to to flee, as it were, which is what Satan is effectively calling him to do. Let's see similar things in Matthew 16. Turn the page over to Matthew 16. Look at verses 13 to 17, and then 21 to 23. So Matthew 16, 13 to 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Meaning himself. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then just go down to verses 21 to 23. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. That's his rebuking Jesus, this Peter is what Peter's doing. Saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So here's a sort of key point in Matthew's Gospel, Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And at this point, Jesus begins to reveal to his disciples his core work that he's come for as Messiah, which is to suffer, is to give himself in suffering and to die. And Peter rebukes Jesus for speaking like this. But what do we see Jesus responding to Peter? We see Jesus vehemently refusing to tolerate any voice calling him from the path of the cross that's set before him. This is the, this is the, these are the things of God, Jesus is saying. These are the things of God that Jesus goes to the cross. This is God's plan. This is God's purpose. And Jesus refuses. I mean, no doubt it was pleasant to hear Jesus. Uh, sorry, to, to hear Peter 
say, you don't need to, you don't need to suffer, Lord. Surely not. Come on. But no, that was the voice of unfaithfulness, just like flee to the mountains like a bird. That voice of David in our passage. It was a voice of unfaithfulness. It was attempting to ward Jesus off suffering. But our faithful Savior refuses to hear of it. He refuses to brook this. He shuts the door to it. He refuses to flee for his own safety, preferring to suffer himself for our redemption and peace. So see how Jesus is a faithful David par excellence. What we see David as in our passage then, in refusing this voice of unfaithfulness, Jesus is to the ultimate degree. He will not abandon his calling to save, despite the horrors of it, despite all the, the many voices urging him to. Let's go to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Again, in a different way, this is a turning point in Luke's Gospel. This is the beginning of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, which we get the end of next week in Palm Sunday. But this is the beginning of it. And what does it say here? Luke, verse, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him, for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Why did Jesus have to set his face to do this? Well, verse 44. Let these words sink into your ears, he says to his disciples. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Or verse 22 of the same chapter. Jesus there says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. He knows what awaits him in Jerusalem. And so we see in verse 51, he sets his face to go there, despising the shame, to use the words of Hebrews 12, verse 2. And then turn over to Luke 13, verses 31 to 33. Luke 13, verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him. Imagine this, Pharisees coming to Jesus, warning Jesus. Some Pharisees come and say to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So here again, David, uh, sorry, Jesus is hearing this, this voice like David heard, flee! There's danger ahead if you keep going this way. But again, Jesus does not divert from his course to Jerusalem and the suffering that he faces there. So there were just so many times that Jesus faced this tempting voice to flee for his own safety. And if at any one of those times Jesus' Jesus's resolve gave way, then our salvation would similarly have been lost. But that was not the case. Jesus held out. He's a faithful saviour, an undeterrable saviour. And you know, even on the cross, Jesus faced calls to save yourself. They were mocking calls. They were jeering, taunting calls. But nonetheless, they were calls to save yourself. Matthew 27, verses 40 and and in verse 42, come down from the cross. Even on the cross, he's facing the same voice. Flee, you can still do it, you can still come down. Of course, Jesus knew he could. But he didn't. He's our faithful, undeterrable saviour. Have you ever been glad to have an excuse not to do something you don't want to do? I confess I have. I mean, it might, I don't know what it might be. Maybe, maybe the snow, I don't know, or some of the weather's kept you in and you... Oh, great, I don't have to do that now. I'm, if you're like me, you've experienced that, I expect. I can certainly be like that. Well, how good it was that Jesus was not like that with our salvation. He didn't look for the earlier sort of opportunity to duck out of it. No, he didn't accept any opportunity to duck out of it. That's the point, isn't it? And as he says in John 10, verse 12, in that passage of the Good Shepherd, 
He will not leave the sheep and flee. That's what the hireling does, isn't it? They look out for the first opportunity to, to flee. The wolf comes. Great, I can, I can go now. I've got a sort of reasonable excuse. No, even when the wolf comes, even when the cross comes, Jesus is faithful because he cares for the sheep. And if Jesus did not abandon us but endured all on the cross to the full measure, to the full degree, to the end, then how sure we can be that he will not abandon his sheep now. How many voices urged him away from the cross, as we've seen. And if he refused all of them and endured such pain to the end, then what encouragement that is to your faith and mine. He cannot fail. He'll see you through. And if some of you got the rat written on your kitchen windowsill, I think, haven't you? He cannot fail. He'll see you through. Now, just to, as we draw to a close, I'd like to finish by considering that passage that we looked at earlier from, uh, from Mark's Gospel, wasn't it, actually? Uh, the Gethsemane passage, which I think our passage especially points towards. And I'd just like to consider Jesus' agonies in Gethsemane, as we read earlier. Because was it not here, I think, that Jesus faced the fiercest temptations to flee? These were Jesus' last moments of freedom before his arrest. In fact, what I read to you went into his arrest. He, he's seized by the time, by, by the point we, we stop reading. And so in Gethsemane, these were his last moments of freedom before his arrest and crucifixion. And Jesus knew what was coming to him if he stayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane. In our passage in verse 2, if you've still got the psalm open, Psalm 11, verse 2, page 452, it speaks of the wicked bending the bow to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. In other words, this voice that's, that's telling David to flee says, look, they can get you even in the dark. They'll, they'll shoot an arrow even in the dark. They'll hit you in the dark. You need to go. And of course, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. Jesus faced this, as it were, an arrow in the dark. He was found in the dark. That was Judas', Judas his role, was to find Jesus in the dark and deliver that arrow that came disguised as a kiss. And so our passage is pointing to this experience Jesus has of this very thing. It happened. Judas's kiss picked out Jesus in the dark. And so Jesus was delivered into the hands of his enemies who would kill him. But you know, in Gethsemane, Jesus grappled with more than just the prospect of crucifixion. And we see that in Gethsemane. Because in Gethsemane, we see that what Jesus most desired to be taken from him was the cup. The cup. And in verse 6 of our psalm, we see why this cup that Jesus wanted to be taken from him was so horrific. Verse 6. Let him rain coals on the wicked. This is, D, uh, G, uh, this is David um, giving us the foundations, what, what the Lord is going to do in judgment. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. So the cup being held out to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, being held out to Jesus by God the Father, was the cup of God's wrath. The cup of God's judgment on sin. That same wrath was poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah for sin. And so we have the language of that in our psalm in verse uh, 6. Raining coals on the wicked, raining fire and sulfur. That's exactly what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities because of their sin in Genesis chapter 19. And so this is what Jesus faced by going ahead with the cross. He faced all the shame and filth and guilt and blame of my sin and yours being handed to Jesus by the Father in the form of, as it were, a cup of the Lord's foaming wrath for Jesus to drink down to the dregs so that Jesus drinks it to save us from it. Jesus drinks it all. We drink it, none of it, to clear us from it entirely. And so praise God that Jesus submitted faithfully to receiving that cup for us. It was agony for him to do so, but he faithfully submitted, not my will but yours, 
and he faithfully went and drank that cup. Some people think that Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane for this cup to be taken from him was evidence of weakness in Jesus, his humanity or something like that. Well, in my view, it's the opposite. In my view, it's, it's evidence of his deity. Now, I know that you, you think I'm, I'm sort of slightly obsessed by this thought, but actually, I, I don't think I am. Uh, but and here's the reason I think that it's evidence of Christ's deity. As God, in his very nature, Jesus knew what was in that cup. He knew the contents of that foaming cup of God's wrath on sin. And Jesus knew it because... He actually poured it himself on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Wasn't he the one that turned up at uh, at Abraham's tent, the previous chapter, with two angels? And then he waits while those two angels are sent down. And then the Lord sends that. That was the Lord Christ in his pre-incarnate existence. You see, Jesus knew what was in that cup. He knew what it was to have fire and sulfur rain down because he'd rained it on Sodom and Gomorrah how many people there are who are blithely going through this life not knowing what will meet them as they face God in their sin when they die but the Lord Jesus though knew what would meet him as he faced God in our sin clothed in our sin He alone, of everyone who ever goes to eschatological judgment, Jesus alone knew what was coming. And so praise to our faithful, undeterrable Saviour that he submitted, not just to the horrors of Roman execution, horrific though that was, unimaginable though that was, but even Jesus submits to drinking all the contents of the cup of God's wrath, which was ours by rights, and that only he knew the full wretchedness of. And Jesus drank it. He humbled himself. He received it. He endured it. He drank it down to its very dregs so that we'd never have to. As I just finish then, can I just ask this? Do you know him? Do you love him as your faithful saviour? Have you taken shelter under his wings for salvation? Jesus did not flee his post as saviour so that you and I can flee to him. He's a faithful saviour so that we can run to him. Christ alone is the shelter from the coming day of God's judgment. His death alone pays the debt of the debt our sin deserves. So if you never have, will you not come? Will you not confess to God your sin and your deserving of his judgment and plead nothing other than this wonderful, saving, sacrificial death of Jesus to save you? Well, may the Lord bless that to the hearts of those that need it. Let's pray.